HyperJSON. That's the name of the thing I'm going to talk about today. And uh, before we start, I would like to mention Pascal, who came up with a, an alternative project name for it. He wanted to call it HydroJSON. <laughs> well, if you don't get this reference, then you're probably too old. But um, this is Pascal's project. So <laughs> it's not my project. My project is called HyperJSON. And before we even continue, I want to tell you that I want to lower your expectations a bit. So probably what you're expecting is this, but I will, what I will deliver is this. Because this is a meetup talk. This is not a conference talk. I don't get paid for it. I didn't have time to prepare much. You will see later on uh, when the slides get less and less and less attention and uh, the formatting breaks apart and then everything goes, goes to hell. So uh, be warned if you have something better to do, then uh, yeah, probably that's a good, good time. Hyperjson. I'm Matthias. I work in Dusseldorf. I come from Bavaria. I do Rust since 2015. Um, I've been involved in many projects, but uh, yeah, not too many you might know of. Probably, maybe, uh, if at all, then Hello Rust, which is a YouTube channel about the Rust programming language. And from time to time, I make weird experiments with uh, Rust and I try my best to come up with something that nobody is ever trying to use and just to have some fun. And this is one of those projects. It's definitely a moonshot project and not something that you should take totally serious, but I'm looking for contributors, so feel free. It's a Python module for encoding and decoding JSON. Now, I already saw a lot of uh, your faces uh, going like this, uh, where, you, where you're like, why even write an encoder? Why another JSON library? <laughs> Just don't do it. If you tell somebody, I write a JSON encoder, that's usually how they look like, because there's tons of them. And also, why? Because parsing JSON is so simple. This is the entire JSON spec. That is all you need to implement your own encoder and decoder. I mean, how hard can this be? You have objects, you have arrays, you have strings as basic types, you have numbers as basic types. The world is so easy. Um, what is JSON, by the way? It's a subset of JavaScript, and I think that's also why it became so popular, because a lot of uh, Browsers already had implementations for JSON interpreters, and so you already had parsers for it when we got started. And so this is why we are still using it until this time. But this is theory. This is more like the reality. When you're parsing JSON, it's a minefield. And I literally mean that. There's an article from somebody uh, Saying JSON is a minefield. That's the title of the article. And I love it. Um, you cannot read that, but the green stuff, this is where we are fine. The rest, not so much. The blue stuff is undefined behavior. So this is, this are gaps in the JSON definition. And the definition that I showed you before has a lot of edge cases and it, that's undefined how to handle this case. Some browser vendors handle it this way. Some others handle it that way. Which is the correct way? Nobody knows. There is no correct way. But what should never happen is that your encoder or decoder crashes because then you have a problem that can cause a lot of issues, including security problems. And this is when you have anything in this grid that is not blue or green. Those are the issues. So on the top, you cannot read it, but there are from left to right, there are C encoders, Java encoders, uh, Lua encoders, Objective-C, Perl, Python, Ruby. It's all in there, Scala, whatever. On the left side, you can see the name of the test. And on the right side, you can see a sample of this test. And a lot of encoders crash. And that's just the reality. You might say, how the hell can something crash in your face. But then you look at those examples and 
I guess you can get a feeling of what it means to write a proper JSON encoder. So those are the tests that are running. And there's everything in there from byte encoding to array encoding, uh, weird formatting, uh, big and uh, small floats, um, escaping, uh, nested arrays, and so on. Now, a lot of people might say, but in practice, that's not really a problem. Well, for example, this is a bug report for the JSON encoder in Python. JSON is a standard library module in Python. You can import it. It's been there since ages, 20 years, I don't know. And uh, that's from 2014. It's already closed. But you could access arbitrary process memory from the JSON module. So an attack vector would be you create a JSON payload which is invaluable, you send it over to this uh, backend application, it will not crash, but it will send back some slice of your process memory. That's bad. Another example, search for stack overflow uh, segmentation fault entries. You will get an entire list of things that can go wrong. Lots of people com uh, complain about invalid uh, uh, memory access, about sec faults, about dangling pointers, and so on. In fact, it's so bad that when you Google for JSON segmentation for Python, you get 80,000 results in 0 0.37 seconds. It's like saying, yeah, you messed up. Um, it's a lot. Now that I know all of this, I look at JSON as more of a total abstrosity. So Hieronymus Bosch um, made this uh, famous painting. It's called Parsing JSON. It's from 1501, and uh, it cannot be more real. So I said, I need to fix this. And I can fix this on my own, of course. It's super easy to write a JSON encoder. And uh, there was a Python hackathon at Trivago not too long ago where I was super bored. I had no other thing to do. And I said, I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to try it. It was April 14, 2018. And I started, I started hacking on this thing. This is me hacking. So this is... This is an actual recording when it happened. So you can see I work on two screens. And on the left side, uh, you have uh, Rust. On the right side, you have um, a Python. And this is how they connect. No, that's not really true. But um, what I wanted to build was something like this. You start up your Python interpreter. You import HyperJSON. And then you can load a string, one. You get one back, which is a Python object. If you put in not a number, you get not a number in a Python object. And if you have a list of things of different types, then this should also give you an error because it's not a string or a byte or a byte array. So you can see I add quotes around it, and then it will compile into the proper Python object. So this is what I had after the first day. And, uh, yeah, you can see it's been a while because I used this old computer for it. It's definitely not something that I just hacked together on my Mac real quick. Um, nice. Oh, by the way, yeah, I wrote this in Rust. I should have told you maybe. It's a Rust meetup. And the reason why I wrote this in Rust is two reasons. Uh, first, I wanted to avoid segmentation faults, dangling pointers. Second, I wanted to use the power of Rust when it comes to uh, performance. So I wanted almost zero overhead. I wanted to hook into the Python interpreter without a garbage collector. I wanted nice bindings similar to C. I wanted to deploy that to the PyP, which is the Python package index, so that you can download it without even knowing that it's written in Rust. All of this kind of stuff. Um, after this prototype, was running, that project set idle for a moment, and uh, then something magical happened because new people came in. That was just me on uh, in the beginning of the project working on my own, 
And then all of a sudden somebody else came, which was a Chinese developer helping me out with, with some Python stuff. He also wrote a, a talk about it. And then uh, some more people came in and uh, yeah, it's, it's growing organically. I'm not saying that it's growing quickly, but at least uh, there's some traction. And that was me just recording this video because I didn't know how Gorse works. Uh, one of the reasons why I got new contributors was that I announced this project on the Rust Reddit forum, got some traction there, some very nice ideas from the users, some comments. I just explained what I wanted to build and why. And then we talked about how to make JSON encoding and decoding even faster than C. And one of the ideas, for example, would be you could use SIMD for some parts of JSON encoding. If you have a big, SIMD is, um, stands for single instruction multiple data. So if you have five integers in a row, that's nice because you can uh, convert all five of them at the same time to Python objects and uh, you get a possible performance boost. Or if you want to be super crazy and Rust allows you to do that, I'm not saying you should do that, but at least Rust allows you to do that, is you can use a parallel execution to convert JSON into Python. Because, well, if you have uh, a nested array or array of subarrays, then you can uh, convert each subarray separately and then merge the result together. And theoretically, you should be faster than the C version because I have not seen a C JSON encoder that is using any threads or any parallel execution. In Rust, you could even have that as a separate crate. So if you have an embedded environment, you wouldn't have to use uh, parallel execution. But if you have a very beefy machine, well, nothing keeps you from adding this feature crate and then all of a sudden your encoding and decoding is three times as fast. So what's the current status? There's a GitHub repository, a couple stars, not too much traction right now, busy with other stuff. But I guess it's, it's nice to, to, to have a baseline for it. Um, I will show you later on um, how uh, it, it looks like in terms of performance. But first, this is roughly uh, the number of lines of code. And from this list, you can already see that we put a very, very big focus on compatibility with other JSON libraries. So HyperJSON now supports all methods that JSON also supports in Python 3.6 and uh, before. And you can see we have, I can even count it. Is it a million or 10 million? It's a million and 87,000 lines of JSON. And... Uh, all of this is possible with roughly 500 lines of Rust. So you might be surprised, you might be saying, wait, you wrote this encoder yourself in 500 lines and it's, it should be safer than the other ones? Well, no, of course not. Uh, I'm using 30 for uh, conversion, so it's just a th thin wrapper around 30. And the wrapper itself is also not written by me, it's PyO3, which is a library for converting Python types to Rust types. So all of this cannot be simpler from my, my side. But I like that you can combine those two and have something magical. So imagine doing the same thing in C. You don't have a package manager, so you have to kind of have a git submodule for the 30, for the serialization part, and then you have a git submodule for the Python conversion part. So that would be a total ball of mud, unmaintainable. In, in Rust, super easy. You have a cargo tomo, you add those two things, you're done. How does a Python module look like that you write in Rust, you might ask? Well, I was thinking about showing you the entirety of the hyperchasing uh, source code, but probably you would not learn much because it's a bit overwhelming if, uh, if you want to learn all this while I scroll by. So instead, I want to show you two simple slides that already implement an entire Python module from scratch and it's usable by you right now. From the Python side, 
Let's say you have a module called lenRS. It's an implementation of the length function in Rust. lenRS can compute the length of a string. For example, five in this case for hello. And it can also return the length of a list. And it cannot convert this into something that is a length, because what is the length of one? Hmm. So it will give you a type error. And that is the entire functionality of length. To build this in Rust, you don't need much code. It fits on one slide. That's the entire thing that you need to create a working Python module in Rust. Let's go through this one by one. First, you need nightly Rust because PyO3 uses a few features like procedural macros. Those are the hashes in front of your, you know, function names there. They are just not available yet in uh, stable Rust. Then you can define a module name. Even with the newer versions, this is not even needed anymore. So it will use the create name by default, I guess. Then you define a function name, let's say length. And then you only write Rust code. So by, by definition, the only thing that is not boilerplate here is our length function. Because this init wrapper, that is just a convention for Python on how modules are structured. Every module has an init and in it, you have the functions. See what I did there? Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful. And you have one length function here. It takes two arguments in our case. First is pi, which is an, an instance of Python, which is the Python runtime. The way this works is in PyO3, the objects always belong to Python. So with that, you solve an ownership problem because you don't really move things around you keep it on the Python side, but you sometimes only hook in when you want to create a Rust object, when you want to convert stuff. Uh, all of those problems with borrowing, lifetimes, ownership, that goes away if you just have Python as your source of truth. And the second thing that we need is an object. That is just a convention. You can also have a string, whatever, but if you want to be very generic and you want to accept any type, then you want a pi object here, because everything in Python is an object, even the number. I'm not sure about the numbers. Probably a lot of people will scream now, like, oh my god, he said numbers are objects. But, uh, for example, strings are objects, and so on. And you always return a pi result. A pi result is just a wrapper around uh, a runtime which takes your Rust thing, your Rust object that you created, and converts it back to Python. And if that conversion fails, then you get an error. But otherwise, you get a Py object back, which the Python interpreter can handle without dropping a beat. You can see that I'm using a nice pattern here, uh, the if let, OK. If I can convert the, the object on the right side to a string, then I return the string length. This is what those two lines mean. Can you see my pointer here? No. I Probably you can't see it in the video, but those two lines, they are quite interesting. We match on the object types that, that we get in. And if, it, if we can extract the string from it, then we return the string length. String length is just a Rust function. And we convert it to an object because why do we need to convert it to an object? Well because objects in Python are ref counted and our string is not. Uh, and the second case is if the object is a vector of strings, then we return the vector length. We could now add more types. This list is maybe not complete. For example, we did not cover dictionaries, sets, your objects. Uh, we could talk about other things on and on, and usually this is the thing that I dealt with most in HyperJSON edge cases. Uh, in this case, 
whenever it's not a string or a vector, we just return a type error. We just say it's not supported. So at least we stay compatible with length uh, of the Python standard lib. And we return an OK. That means the initialization was correct. That's it. That's the entire Python module to get started. And you can now write Python extensions. If that was a bit too fast, I even have an episode of Hello Rust on the web, uh, episode number eight, where I explain that to you and you can follow along while I build this uh, module. We will run it, we will compile it. This is me programming. I totally did not insert this screenshot while we were on the train to Cologne. <laughs> it, this is not a loading screen. This is a, a reverted C in the middle of the screen. <laughs> and please ignore a Yocto of, because it's not public. Uh, <laughs> Let me show you some code. First of all, this is some performance data. Not always are we faster than the fastest uh, JSON encoders. There are faster ones. The biggest competitor for us is MicroJSON, UJSON, which is around since 14 years. Uh, we are around since April, so we have some gap to catch up, but we will get there in the end. At least we have the 30 core developer also working on it, so uh, it could be worse. <laughs> Sometimes though, we are faster, especially with, with, with simple types, like uh, we have, these are not 256 doubles in an array. These are 256 arrays with doubles. Uh, those tests, they come from MicroJSON itself. We just converted it to PyTest, which makes benchmarking really idiomatic, really fast. Uh, those tests will be running uh, multiple times on a warm cache, and uh, you get the standard deviation, you get the mean, you get the median, so scientifically it's correct. We just use those weird graphs because people focus a lot on benchmarks, and they think that uh, those are hard numbers, but in fact, everybody knows that this can fluctuate a bit based on your machine. So take that with a grain of salt, but it's just a, a rough comparison on one test machine on my Mac. And uh, yeah, sometimes we are fast. Usually we are somewhere in the middle, but um, we're, we're catching up quickly, I guess. Uh, give it a, a few more months and then uh, let's see what happens. Famous last words. Uh, before I leave you, let me give you a quick overview of the code. Shall I make that uh, black or white? Is it readable? Yeah. Uh, keep it this way. Can also, maybe. Uh, I, will, I will use a, br oh no. I will use a white theme. Uh. Ah, that's better, huh? <laughs> I don't care. Uh, um, yeah, um, most of the things you've already seen. PyO3, I'm using 30 for the JSON conversion, as I told you. Then we're using Nightly Rust. You can see that from the features that we need to use here. We are using failures for failures, and then we convert that to Python types, which is quite nice because you get the best of both worlds. Uh, error handling is very nice in this case. Uh, yeah. Here's the code. Here are all the implementations of the functions. So here's the load implementation, which just forwards it to loads fn. Uh, we'll get to that. Here, here it is. And that was extracted to loads impl because we also do benchmarking on that and profiling to find bottlenecks and, and improve the speed. Yeah, but uh, the, the basic implementation is this. You try to match on different types uh, in Rust. You say, uh, extract a string from it if we can uh, extract a string, then deserialize it um, to a Python object, 
otherwise convert some special floats. For example, Python knows not a number or minus infinite and plus infinite, which is definitely not in the JSON standard, but uh, Python in their heavily um, intuition, they decided that it's a good idea to extend the standard a bit. And otherwise we return a value error like the normal standard lib uh, module. Then we uh, convert byte arrays, that's for UTF-8 support. Um, yeah, some macros for, for conversion, but it's more or less the same thing. We always use extract and we match on the result. And if so, then we serialize with 30. Uh, not much else to show. Some tests. Yeah, I guess we can run it once. I was wise enough to um, increase the screen size. So if you run make install, it will download all the dependencies from pip to uh, create the bindings, uh, like um, set up uh, Rust, uh, Rust setup. What is it called? Setup, Rust, Rust setup, something like this. Is it called Rust something something? Uh, and uh, yeah, then we can use it. So we use our Python interpreter. Is that still readable? Yeah, I hope so. Import hyper JSON, hyper JSON dot load s. We say one, and you get a one back. And uh, yeah, all the other functions you can read in the spec. There is an entire documentation page about it where we also take our unit tests from. We have, we have plenty of tests. I'm not sure if all of them run. Probably this will be, yeah. You can see uh, that it's testing all the things. We have a few skip tests, which are known issues, but we're working on them. I'm not saying that we are free of segmentation faults, but at least we aim very, very hard to, to make that possible. Um, apart from that, that's uh, it for my talk. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, then now is your time and also use the microphone. There's a question, Kai. <laughs> Kai didn't have any questions. It's the awkward moment when nobody has questions, but we just wait for a question to arise. <laughs> so I didn't fully understand. You do the serialization yourself or you use something existing? Thank you. I use something existing, which is called Surdy JSON. It's a JSON library for Rust. It's in a crate. And it is one of the fastest around. So in any implementation, any language, uh, and this is also the beauty of it. This is what inspired me to use it because it's just so freaking fast. And just to piggyback on that, I wrote this small wrapper around it. So, so the pipe is um, that you first uh, pass JSON to a Rust internal data structure and then run over it to create Python or do you do, do this uh, Python creation on the fly? Yeah, more or less it's the, the first. So... Surdy will convert it to whatever it should convert to. It can convert to many, many different outputs. So it can take JSON and convert it to, yeah, Python, for example, which in this case, I more or less wrote this wrapper for. But um, yeah, internally, Surdy is of course written in Rust. So you get some, uh, you get at least some, some Rust glue code in between, but the, the output in the end is Python. And most of the things that Surdy are doing are, yeah, just just converting on the, the byte level. So it's not really a big overhead. Yeah. So uh, wh where would you see then some performance improvements? Like how, how will you get faster than, for example, the micro JSON implementation? Will you? 
like talk to the third adjacent people and make them maybe aware of some kind of performance problems they could have? Or where where is the performance critical point or the bottleneck right now? Is it like the, the conversion to the Python object or like the glue code in between? Or Yeah, a lot of it... Uh just comes from the complexity of the Python uh, interpreter. Uh, one of the bigger things is UTF-8 support right now. UTF-8 and, and ASCII are supported in, in uh, both Python versions, so we support Python 2 and 3. Um, that's something that you have to tackle. Most of the things, uh, we just run some profiling. We see that we have a bottleneck, for example, in the hash map generation, and then we can fix that uh, iteratively. But you can learn a lot just by reading the ultra JSON implementation because, for example, some, some things that they do are predictive analysis on what might be the next object that will be converted and prioritizing in their implementation and maybe uh, making a quick exit there and uh, some, some hand-coded uh, conversion there. So uh, 30 is nice. But uh, if you really find a bottleneck, then you can also come up with your own implementations. Uh, another thing is, for example, for dictionaries, we use a B-tree uh, map. And uh, maybe that's not the best, uh, because as far as I remember, it's cryptographically safe, but we don't really need that. So maybe a faster hashing algorithm might be a good choice to speed it up. Uh, once we reach... A certain level of performance which we are happy with and which kind of matches the C implementations. This is where the real fun can begin because then you can start um, you can start uh, parallelizing things. You can you can use more Rust features that you don't have in, in uh, C like fearless concurrency, uh, like super out of the box simple SIMD support, uh, zero cost abstractions, all that kind of stuff. Um, there was a longish discussion on this subreddit uh, entry for HyperJSON. So if you're interested in that, then check it out. There were a lot of very knowledgeable people. And a, f a few also created issues for HyperJSON, how to improve it, had some own ideas and so on. But first, you always have to mo measure, you have to profile, and then improve. And it's just... In the end, it's a painful process because it takes a long time and you get maybe a 5% improvement here and there, but yeah, it takes time. Thank you. you had a question? Yeah, it's more, it's more or less answered already. Um, I was wondering whether there is some significant overhead by converting the objects between Python and Rust and, and back. Because um, I, I could imagine that there are some allocations happening there, especially for large objects. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. That's one thing that uh, you can use to, to improve the code. So instead of working on own types and on the heap, uh, you could work on views into memory. Uh, one idea is, for example, uh, using a clone on write string instead of a real own string. Because in Python, you already have the string. And when you use Rust, you already can access this memory. But then we convert it to a string again. So we allocate memory on the heap. And then we convert it back. And you have two allocations which are super useless because you have the clone on write. You, you have the view on, in memory. It gives you the Rust guarantees, but without the overhead of additional allocations. And al allocations are one bottleneck right now for, for our performance. Um, we do a lot of allocations, as you can imagine. So those examples, they, they are kind of extreme because nobody will have those JSON payloads. They are crazy big. So as I told you, millions of lines of JSON. But uh, yeah, it can happen in practice. And this is also what we want to optimize for. If you have a, a small JSON payload, hyper-JSON is not going to help you. Uh, the big, bigger bottleneck is going to be your system, I.O., and so on. But you have large payloads and a lot of payloads. This is where you might want to have a proper encoder. So the, the, the final goal where I want to use it is a library of mine called Kafka InfluxDB which connects Kafka with InfluxDB. 
You might be surprised. Um, just by looking at the name, you, you might not have guessed. Uh, and I'm using Ultra JSON here already. And you can see this is Ultra JSON here. And the green one is the normal JSON in, uh, implementation in, in uh, well, actually, no. That's not really true. Uh, this is for the Confluent consumer in Kafka. But it's a similar thing. It's, it's a Rust binding where before you had a Python implementation. But uh, you can use Ultra JSON with Kafka InfluxDB to make conversion even faster. And I would like to use it there once it becomes faster than Ultra JSON. So that's kind of the, the goal. Okay then, thank you very much.